Hey, here we are in on the south coast of England in amazing weather. I'm with Glenn Scrivener here. He's evangelist from the Hour of Revival Ministries. And we're really thinking about how to share Jesus with the whole world. Everyone we meet, we're looking, there's hundreds and hundreds of people outside. And we keep thinking, let's go out and tell them all about Jesus. But before we do that, we've got to think, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. And Glenn's been thinking a lot about how to share pe the, the Lord Jesus with people. How, how can we actually do that? Is it impossible to do? Is it too difficult? Lots of us think, oh, I don't know how to do that. Well, Glenn's been thinking about it and he's developed a, a resource called 321. Yeah. What's that? Well, 321 is just a gospel outline and it doesn't tell you all the events that happen in the Bible and it doesn't really tell you all the events that happen uh, in the gospel even, but it gives you a context in which to think about the gospel and think about Jesus and what he's done for us. So 321 is, is sort of the mnemonic and uh, three is a truth about God. Uh, three is uh, God is three persons united in love. So it's a, a truth about Trinity. So um, I, I often perhaps go to uh, Jesus' baptism, perhaps from Mark chapter 1 or Luke chapter 3. Um, and I, I talk about, well, there is Jesus uh, at the Jordan River, at the sinner's convention. And uh, all the people who know that they're spiritually rubbish show up and they confess their sins. They show up, they say, look, I need a wash on the inside, not just on the outside, on the inside. And, uh, and they jump in the water and then Jesus shows up and he actually jumps in the water with them. It's, it's this incredible truth that he comes to join us in our filth in order that we might join him in his family. And here's where I start talking about three. What's Jesus' family? As he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes on him like a dove. And the, whole, uh, and, and the Father says, you are my son who I love. With you I am well pleased. And that's the three. Jesus, full of the Spirit, the Son of the Father, and I say, that's the family you were made for, this family of love. And Jesus came into our filth to invite you into that family. So that's the good news. Trinity is the good news that God is love and you're invited. That's the truth of three. And then I start talking about two. And I say, sort of the world is shaped by two representatives. The Bible tells a story that in the beginning there was Adam. And uh, Adam was kind of like a ruler over the world. Uh, and yet, through mistrust, Adam turned from himself, turned in on himself, turned from God and, and kind of plunged the world into death and curse and chaos. Uh, and, and the reason why there's such darkness in the world is that uh, Adam, uh, the head of our human race, has turned away from God. And we're all just chips off the same block. We all participate in that same kind of broken humanity. And we feel the curse of this broken world. It doesn't look very cursed right now, does it? No. And yet, you know, just, just out of shot, there's, a, there's a, one of the other piers that was here uh, many years ago. It's just burnt down. It's an old wreck of a thing. And actually, you know, the world is very much like that wonderful beginning. And yet through Adam has come down into curse. Jesus is the second Adam. He is the second one of, of the truth of two. And he comes into our humanity to do right what we always do wrong. So he lives the life that we should have lived. And then on the cross, he dies the death that we should, uh, we should die for all our sins. Takes all that sin on himself and exhausts God's anger on that cross. Takes the punishment that we deserve. Goes down into the grave. Rises up again and says, belong to me. And that's really the truth of one. The truth of one is we are born one with Adam. We're all chips off the old block. We all participate in the old humanity. We're all selfish like he was selfish. And we're all suspicious like he was suspicious. We're all self-justifying like he was self-justifying. Uh, and yet Jesus says, well, belong to me. Come to me. Be one with me. And, uh, and you know what? You can give me all your sin. I'll take it. And I'll take it and I'll, and I'll pay for it on that cross. And then I'll give you all my righteousness. We'll be one forever. And now as we're one with Jesus, we're filled with his same spirit. We call on that same Father and we belong to Jesus forever. We're, we're, we're part of the three. So that's, that's kind of one way of doing it, three, two, and one. Okay, so that's the overview of how three, two, one works and how we explain all that. But if I can, now let's take that apart a little bit and look at each bit more individually. And if I can just put some of the questions that people might have on and that I might have two about these, three, then two, then one. Let's begin with that three. Because do you understand? I mean, uh, maybe a lot of people would go, ah, three, what's he going to talk about then? 
it can't be God because God's number is one, yeah, one right. God. And loads of times when you get books on theology, they'll go, oh, the big thing about God is there's one God. Yeah. And then Christians would tend to go, well, the most important thing about us were monotheists, meaning the most, the most important thing about us is we believe in one God. And we're mm. a bit like Muslims, we're a bit like Jews, we're a bit like anyone else who believes in one God. And then, OK, we do have a few other things we believe in as well, and we'll get to those later. But let's do the big stuff first, that there's mm. one God and the number is one but you're like no no the number is three three for is the magic That's number yeah. can't, can't we just use the word god yeah. and then leave all that i know the trinity stuff isn't that like an advanced module why yes. do we we don't start with trinity do yeah. we yeah I, I know you don't believe all of that um, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> i think a huge question in evangelism is which god are we talking about which god are we talking about you know and if somebody on the streets if i stopped somebody on the streets and started talking to them about god you know probably more than 50 percent would say yeah i kind of believe in god less than 50 percent would say yeah i don't believe in god but in neither case would they probably be talking about jesus yeah. And I think the big question, if someone says they do believe in God, is which God? And if someone says they don't believe in God, the big question is, well, which God don't you believe in? Yeah. And if you ask someone on the, on the beach, which God don't you believe in? You can be sure that they'd start describing pretty much the, the individual, like up in the sky, high on power, low on personality, um, you know, which, who is an eminently rejectable God, yeah. you know, and, and we might find ourselves agreeing with the non-Christian. They say, well, I, I'm not really into God because I think he's like that. And, and I think the Christian can say, you're right, you're right. You know, that's yeah. not God. Let me tell you about Jesus. And I think the truth of three is trying to put Jesus front and center in the issue of God. Um, because, I mean, trying to, I'm not even trying to be Trinitarian. Like, in, yeah. in a sense, I mean, who cares about the name Trinity? Yeah, yeah. Who cares about being Trinitarian? What I want to talk about is the God of Jesus. Yeah. But as soon as you talk about the God of Jesus, you're talking about the one who is filled with the Spirit. That's what Christ means. And he's son of the Father, the Son of God. And the most, the most obvious way that Jesus is always described in the Bible is he is the Christ, the Son of God. So if you want to talk about the God of Jesus, you've got to talk about three. You've got to talk about Trinity. Um, and it's and it's not bad news to talk about Trinity. It's 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 a fantastic thing, isn't it? You know. Yeah. No, I think that's so important that if we want to talk about Jesus, you cannot postpone talk about the real and living God, yeah. who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yeah. and the real and living God. You, if we just say, well. I want to talk about the real and living God, but we'll, we'll leave that Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that is the real and living God. There's nothing to say about God. You can't say, well, let, what about that idea that sometimes people say, well, let's just talk about the being of God. Let's establish that God exists and right. they, let's, you know, whatever, we'll leave all that about who that is, but let's talk about the being of God, the existence of God. Mm. And, and then let's get that out there first and yeah. prove the existence of God. And then, okay, Maybe we could go into this other stuff later. Is yeah. that feasible? Um, no, not not for a second. Because I mean, a a you've got an eminently rejectable God. You, yeah. Let's let's start with you know pure power in the sky. Let's start with that yeah. as a as as a as a building block. Does that does that help you? It, just from an emotional level, that's yeah. that's not a great start. But but the real thing that kills it is what are you going to do about Jesus? Yeah. You know, if you're not going to begin with Jesus, how are you going to get him in later on? And if he comes later on, you're going to give very much the impression uh, that he's just a secondary figure. Yeah. Who, who shows up halfway through human history, uh, yeah. you know, who has nothing to do with creation and fall and all the problems of life, but he's this, this, this sort of third party who comes in and then God zaps him on the cross. <laughs> What's, hey, What's hang on, yeah. you know, that's how unfair. Yeah. Either that or, or he just, people, people very often preach like this, you know, that there's just this God and then God comes in the flesh and God dies and God rises again. And, and you know, it's an ancient heresy called modalism yes. um, and roundly condemned throughout church history, yeah. rightly so. If you want to confess Christ properly, you've got to begin with Christ. You can't crowbar Christ in later once you've already defined who God is. It just doesn't work. I think that's helpful because there is a way in which sometimes people say, let's get stuff, reason stuff. And like the existence of God or some kind of God, that's stuff that's reason. We can do, let's do all that. And then we can build on top of that some of this revelation stuff. And maybe we could bring Jesus in at that point and maybe a bit of Trinity. But of course, it seems to me if you do that, you're kind of saying, 
Trinity and Jesus is irrational, yeah. whereas yeah. monotheism, yeah. that's really rational. So then we're really kind of saying, well, the Muslims then... And then and, and, and Unitarians, they're kind of more rational because they're saying we're just going to do the reason thing. Yeah. And we won't we don't want to do the irrational stuff. Yeah. No, that's yeah. got to be wrong. And so often, I mean, the prime evangelistic strategy is just to get the scriptures into people's hands. And, and so what I'm always trying to do is, is put especially the Gospels into people's hands. And, and yes. what I see is unbelievers reading through the Gospels and they meet this laughing, crying, angry despondent at times, full yeah. of, you know, full of life and vitality and dependence on God yes. and, and, and this God who bleeds and suffers and dies yeah. and all this sort of stuff. But if we've begun with, I know who God is. God is the unmoved mover, right? Yes. And then they see this most moved, most moving Christ and they say, oh, I'm really attracted to that guy. Um, how does that yeah. how does that go together with this God who you've already introduced yes. me to? Yeah. And then at that point you have to do some real jiggery pokery <laughs> yeah. and kind of say, ah, yeah, well that's yeah. just the humany bit of God, and uh, that's the humany yeah. bit of Jesus. And there's there's another God bit of Jesus that's not like that at all. And not and yet. the non-Christian is not impressed by that. Because <laughs> not, not suddenly what sound is so simple and attractive yeah. is this incredibly complicated philosophical yeah. system. Yeah. And that's and that's never going to do. And that, because I, that's why I know that we both like that quote from Athanasius, yeah. where he's really at, in his day that was going on, where there were people who were saying, hang on a minute. We already know what God's like. Yeah. God's like this. Yeah. Ah, Now, Jesus, um, he looks a bit different. He doesn't quite fit into the God we already know. And we got mm. all the main things about God yeah. here. Ah, ah, Jesus. Yeah, he doesn't like that. Actually, he's not probably really God. Let's make him a junior assistant. A junior kind of assistant. A, yeah, yeah. So what's the quote? Go on, you give it. It's beautiful. The only system of thought into which Jesus Christ will fit is the one in which he's the starting point. What does that mean in that well, way? It means that unless you begin by talking about the God of Jesus, you can never put a truly divine, fully fully divine Jesus into your story yeah. uh, because he's, he's always going to have to slot in under this other thing that you've defined to be God in, 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 at yeah. the outset. So that's why you begin with three. That's why you begin with the, the God of Jesus. And it's why it's sometimes I, I, I would read big theology books since I was quite small and I look back and I think quite a few of the ones on my shelf have... I'll open them up and it'll be, this is the doctrine of God or something. And mm. there might be like 190 pages saying yeah. about, this is all the things yeah. we know about God we, before yeah. we ever mention Jesus or the Trinity. I've got, a, I've got one on my shelf that's 620 pages. Wow! Until you get to Jesus. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. a record. I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to try and beat that. No, I don't want to beat it. That's a <laughs> yeah. horrible book. Yeah. But isn't that nuts where person, yeah. and that presumably is written by a Christian? Oh, yeah. Inverted comment, mm. whatever, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, isn't that an incredible situation to yeah. be in where he probably yeah. was trying to write that with good intentions and yeah. trying to say, I want to say everything I know about God before I get to Jesus. And we yeah. want to go, whoa, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. And then the Trinity just becomes one of the, yes. the many flavorings to God. You know, one of the aspects of God is that he's Trinity, but, but not that his fundamental character and nature is Father, loving Son, Son. in the power and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Once you begin there, oh my goodness, you've, you've got such an attractive God, yeah. don't you? Makes right sense. there, you've got 1 John 4, oh. you know, God is love. You know, it doesn't just say God is loving yeah. as though that's one aspect of his character. Yeah. He's quite loving and he's quite just and he's yeah. quite fair and he's compassionate. No, he is love. In that, he is a father always pouring life and love in the spirit onto his son. And, and when you begin evangelism there, it's very much a case of saying, there is a family, do you want to belong? Yes. When you just begin with the power God from the beginning, yes. how is your gospel going to sort of unpack? It's got to have to be, God is big, bow. Yes. It's going to have to be it. Yeah. That's how the gospel will necessarily develop if you don't yeah. begin with three. Yes. So then the, the, it's all about power, submit, all that. Yeah. And that's why even when we start on page one of the Bible, yeah. and then you, if you try and read that, as if, and you've got in your head this one single person thing, yeah. you can't make sense of the world. No. You can't make no. sense of yourself. No. But when we read it as it's actually written, yeah. the Father creates everything through his word in the power of the Spirit. That's there on page one of the Bible. Then you look at the world and you see there is a way in which it's all held together. It's got an underlying unity, but the diversity of it all yeah. and human life like that. Human and, Life, Instead yeah. of like, those views that have this one absolute 
absolute thing. Yeah. I'll say, everybody's got to be the same. Speak yeah. the same language, dress the same clothes, and nobody's allowed to be different. Yeah. And then the living guy's like, no, no, actually, I love everyone being quite different. Yeah. And then there's also a way in which we're all together. Yeah, and there's harmony and all that sort of stuff. It's so, beautiful. I mean, there's some teaching I do on Genesis 1 in which I, I sort of say, in the beginning, what do you picture? And I reckon you've only got four options, really. In the beginning, there was nothing. And then, boom, out of nothing comes everything. It's, it's, life's an absurdity then. Yeah. Or in the beginning, there was chaos, just uh, warring forces and that kind yes. of thing. Li therefore, life's just a battle these days. Or in the beginning, there was power. Maybe there was just this one God. Yes. But then all of life is slavery. Yes. What if in the beginning there was love? Uh, in which case, doesn't that make sense of why the greatest things at the end of today will be people? Yeah. You know, when my head hits the pillow, I will love you know, these interactions and I will yeah. love communication and, and the things that hurt the most are when yeah. relationships are broken. Doesn't this make sense of our world? Doesn't it make sense of our world when we begin with three? I love that. And it, just in my own experience, when I, uh, we first really starting to learn how to share Jesus with people and Liz, my wife and I, we go to Speaker's Corner and then we met uh, Muslims and lots of other people with their different ideologies and things. And of course, they're the first things they came at us. is yeah. like, yeah. what's this Trinity thing? Yeah. And we, w we hadn't thought it through remotely yeah. enough. And yeah. we genuinely were just like, I don't know. It's a mystery, <laughs> which, yeah. Yeah. which we yeah. could have got away with before. But mm. of course, these people were yeah. quite right. And I'm always grateful to them for saying, yeah. rubbish. Yeah. You're yeah. coming here trying to sell something and you don't even know what it is. And your foundation is the mystery. <laughs> like, your foundation, like, 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 like when we yeah. get to the bottom, you say you don't know what you're standing on, <laughs> yeah. which we were rot because we, yeah. of course, that's absurd. Yeah. If I cannot say this is what I mean by yeah. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, yeah. I shouldn't be saying anything. No. So we had to spend a year yeah. like going back to the scripture and saying surely the bible tells us what this means father yes. son and Holy Spirit. which yeah. of course the yeah. bible does in beautiful ways yeah. all the time and in far from it being this incredibly difficult thing to understand mm. it's actually amazingly simple and i love the fact the bible kind of begins where the, the trinity goes let's make something that's let's can we let's mm. make mm. an example of us yeah. so that people will find us really easy to understand yeah. And what yeah. happened? Yeah, so they, so God made humanity, male and fem female. He He created them uh, in, in order to to bring them together as one to you know be fruitful and make a third. And you know, so beautiful. beautiful. So what what does it look like for God to be pictured in this world? It looks like community. It looks like persons united in love. Therefore, what's a good definition of God? What about three persons united in love? <laughs> and then when the Muslim asks that question and and they get the the straight answer, yeah. three persons united in love, it it suddenly. You can move the conversation we forward. Can move forward. Before you if, you, if you, if you fudged on that question, yes. then you're scuppered. Um, yes. And quite rightly, you're scuppered yeah. because they've just asked you the most fundamental truth about your God yeah. and you don't know. You, you know. don't even know. But I mean, th I, mean, I mean, you've helped me so much with, with Trinity. And, and, and I remember going into a university last year, uh, had a very large Muslim presence. The, the, the Muslim, uh, the Islamic society was about four or five times the size of the Christian Union. Right. And we were doing these events and uh, the Islamic society were always sending people in to ask questions. Um, and in a two-hour uh, two hour event, they, they sent in five different groups of people to ask questions at various points, and then they leave again. And, of course, the only question they asked was, I don't understand the Trinity. Can you explain it to me? And, and thankfully, because I've done some thinking about it, because, because I've been helped by you and by the Scriptures and by others, I was just able to say three persons united in love. What was fascinating was they would get that answer, have nothing more to say, and leave. The next person would come in and be unaware yeah. that that question had been asked and answered. And by the third or fourth time, I was getting non-Christians in the room to answer the question. It's three pieces united in love. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and at that point, you can then move the conversation on. That's um, great. Maybe if I just have one more question on the three and then yeah. we'll move on. There's a lot of people would go, I know a way of understanding the Trinity. Uh. It's a bit like, hang on, <laughs> let me get a block of ice and then I'll uh. warm it up and it becomes water and then keep warming it up and it becomes steam. Yes. That's the Trinity. That's the Trinity. Is that good? Or there's a banana. I've not heard that. What's yeah, the okay, banana you peel one? banana. You put your finger down on the top of the banana and it peels uh, into three different sections. Does Would that you believe happen? it? Father, Son, and Spirit. I've never right seen that. One. Glory. Brilliant. Or, or is it brilliant? It's not brilliant no. at all. Oh, is there, or, there's quite a few of these, aren't there? Cheesecake. Somebody came up with cheesecake. Cheesecake. The other day. Well, that sounds there's the, there's great. The base, I like the, it already. There's, there's the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the base, the filling, and then the chocolate sprinkling. I don't know which of the persons is the chocolate sprinkling, but oh, um, man, I'll think of that. What's what's wrong? Are they good or bad? Well. A, they're hideous for teaching heresy, aren't they? Okay. Because, I mean, the block of ice, let's take all that. Right. That's, that's uh, the most famous one, isn't it? H2O is never all three states at once. 
Uh, according to my limited knowledge of That's of true, physics. because even when they, I've seen it done, when they have yeah. a block of ice and yeah. then they have a Bunsen burner, yes. and then we watch as it goes from ice yeah. to water to steam, yeah. and then they go, there you go, Trinity. There you go, Trinity. But, and what's that preaching? The Father in the Incarnation becomes the Son, and then in the Ascension and by Pentecost becomes the Spirit. Oh, and that's it, modalism. You've just got that modalism heresy on your hands. What I find fascinating about that is why anyone ever needs exactly. analogies. Yeah. Like, literally, you say three persons united in love. Yeah. Do you not know any other examples like, like that? Yeah. <laughs> like, Can you think of something a bit like that? Like, yeah. oh, there's it's a like an egg. walking along. It's going, like an egg. There's <laughs> a shell. Like, why do you even need that? Yeah. I think it, it just shows how, how far we are from a biblical understanding yes. of Trinity that we even reach for these yeah. illustrations. Why do we need three persons united in yeah. love? A three-year-old understands that. A three-year-old. And that's why it's great with church as well. Where you'll say, I tell you, I love it where the church fathers yeah. would always go, tell you what, just go to church. You'll yeah. know what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that John 17 point, John isn't 17. it? John 17. I pray that they will be one, Father, just as you and I are one. So in what way is God one? Yeah. Go to your local church. Go to church, you'll see it. See persons united in love. Beautiful. Who is God? Three persons united in love. So we've thought about three. Mm. Let's think about two. Now, obviously, when you set the two up and, uh, and listening carefully and you said, I want to talk about Jesus, and I'm like, yeah, I, I thought he was going to want to talk about Jesus. He's yeah. made that quite clear. <laughs> um, but Adam, mm. you can't seriously, if I'd be a little bit of the devil's advocate again, yeah. Talk about Adam. That's like the, one of the most controversial subjects in the world. Like nobody believes in Adam. Yeah. Surely that's at least, that's one thing that although the Bible probably in some sense mentions Adam, yeah. can't we just push that to one side? Because isn't that raising problems? Is it necessary to talk about Adam? It is necessary to talk about Adam because we need to frame the problem with the world, not simply in terms of our behavior, but in terms of our being. Ah. And when we start talking about Jesus and Adam, or Adam and Jesus, we start talking about the, the problem that we face as a race, not simply in terms of, you know, I mess up and I, I simply that I fall short of God's glory, uh, but that in, in, in terms of as I come into this world, I'm, I'm part of a broken world around me, but also a broken heart within me. So what Adam is trying to do, and I, and I try to park issues about the yeah. historicity sure. of Adam, for a little while, we'll, we'll talk about what I say later on, but, but what I try to do is try to make emotional sense of it. I, I, I just basically say, um, you know, we can all understand Adam's story because we've all got a, a family tree, don't we? Yeah. And at some point in your family tree, somebody broke off from, you know, living in one part of the world and maybe they survived the war or they left the convent or they, yeah. you know, they were sent away and, and suddenly your branch of the family tree broke. And for me, in 1788, you know, Anne Forbes yeah. was uh, my ancestor who stole 20 yards of printed cotton. And she Is was, that right? Yeah, yeah, convict stock. So, oh, Glenn, yeah. It's a badge of honour in yeah. Australia. It's a badge of honour. But she got, she got sent to Australia and... Um, and, and really, in her getting sent to Australia, I was sent to Australia. And, and, yes. and, in, and in a sense, you know, 6,000 people have actually descended from Anne Forbes o over the years. And, and actually, that one crime and that one exile has affected us all. And we're all born Australians. away from... Australians. Australians, yes. <laughs> Although I think, I think crime does pay. Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, she, nice. She left the set of uh, Oliver Twist and round, wound up on the set of Home and Away. Really? I think, oh, I think yeah, she, nice. I think she did Good well. exchange. But she, she was, you know, she went, you know, exiled from the mother country. Yes. And I was born in exile from the mother country. And what we're saying fundamentally yes. is that we're born into a situation in which we're, we're far from God. Yeah. We don't know God. We, we've all had the experience, and I say this to non-Christians, we've all had the experience of praying and it just feels like the prayers just bounce off the ceiling. Yeah. There's been a disconnection. So it's like we're a cut, you know, cut flowers that have been sort of wrenched from their natural source. And, and we've got a bit of life in us, but we're yeah. perishing. And you know we're perishing, yeah. don't you, non-Christian? Of yeah. course you know that we're perishing. And then I talk a little bit about you know, the characteristics of Adam, how he was suspicious of God and you know aren't you suspicious of yeah. God and, and how he was self-justifying yes you know and aren't you self-justifying yes. and and how he was selfish and yeah. aren't, aren't you Blame selfish yeah. um, and he hides too. and he hides yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah shame. all all a part of it and the shame of it and and just the stuff ups you know don't yeah. don't just things just they they just sometimes I, I I'll say such loving words to my wife and then the next minute I'll say something really really harsh Oh, I, think, yeah. I think, what's what, that about? What came over me? Yeah. And, and actually, nothing came over me. It came out of me. It came out of something really deep. And I think at this point, I'm really mm. trying to put my finger on 
the problem with the human race is not just my deeds, my behavior, mm. it's my being. Yes. There's something really broken about it. I think that connects. It connects. And I found that when I, because where I live, there's, I live in an area where most of my neighbors are either Hindu or Muslim. Mm. And the concept of shame is very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah. And when that story with Adam, yeah. and the, the first thing it hits them is the concept that they're shameful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, a very, that's an important thing that is often neglected when we talk about the, yes. the, uh, the Jesus and how he's held, what yes. he does to clothe us. Yes. And he covers our shame. Yes. Yes. Now, that is it. So, People often in Europe get the idea maybe of guilt more. Yes, yes. But shame, no, but where yeah. I am, yeah. the and the Adam story is like immediately more accessible because yeah. of shame. Yeah, and so, yeah, so in a more Western context, maybe the price yeah. is paid speaks to us in a certain way, but where shame is the issue, you know, yes. Christ covers you. Covers. Is so important. Um, yeah. And so, and I think as we, and that really is to do with that, that, that being issue. Yes. There's a stain, there's an uncleanness yeah. to me, yes. rather than just that there's a record of offences that stands against me. I think that uncleanness thing, because again, I'm reading through scripture, there's so much to do with uncleanness and yeah. washing away uncleanness, yeah. which isn't always picked up on adequately yeah. in our yeah. preaching. But yeah. this is a good way into doing that, isn't it? So, going, so there's, there's guilt and that, but there's also cleansing. I and mean, you get all that by starting that point. Yeah. But let me just ask you though, because... It does sound like if we go that my problem is Adam, doesn't that kind of, I'm, I'm responsible for myself, aren't I? I've got to, look, it's me that's the yep. problem with me, isn't it? Yep. Like, yep. It sounds like a bit like I'm helpless if the problem is Adam. Yeah, and in one sense, absolutely, we are helpless when it comes to closing the gap between ourselves and the Most High. Yep. Um, now, absolutely, I'm, I'm responsible in this world and, and, and must be held responsible in this world. And, and yet to, to imagine that, that I can take responsibility for my path to heaven. Now, that's, that's the real blasphemy that we need to fight against. And that's why the, the being problem needs to, be, needs to be front and center. But I'd also say, you know, there's an organic thing to yes. the, the way that Jesus speaks about trees and fruits. You know, a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. And, and you know, when I say those terrible things to my wife... It does come from me. Yeah. You know, in, in a sense, I'm helpless to do otherwise in, in, in one very limited sense. But in, in another sense, it's truly me. That's me with the handbrake off. Yeah. And I know it. Yeah. I know that's me. The trouble is, if, if we want to take everything into our own hands and say, I am, yeah, all the problem is to do with me and my choices. Mm. What do we communicate about the solution? You know, if the problem is me and my bad decisions, immediately you're communicating that, well, surely, surely the correct response to all that is I need to just clean up my act and start making some good choices. Yes. And, and quite often gospel presentations almost go into that. Yes. Um, so that, that's why I think it's so important to deal with the, the issue of being, and, and that's where Adam comes in. Like the what I am thing. And that, right. there's that sense in which we look at the world, and in one sense people think, we're all individuals, you know, and that we in today's society, lots of people, I'm my own person. I totally yeah. am different than everybody else. But in a way, the God, look, when we look back a bit, we're like, we're not really very different from each other. No. And we're all no. kind of driven by the same yeah. passions. And, and we're determined so much by our families. And yes. the older you get, the more you realize you sound exactly like your parents <laughs> and the more that freaks you out. And, freaks you out. and yet, you know, I, I was born in the 20th century yeah. in Canberra in Australia. And how different I would have been with a different family, different stuff. And so many aspects of my life have yeah. nothing to do with my choices. Yeah. You know, we always think we're, we are, you know, the, the result of all our choices. Yes. And, you know, we introduce ourselves to people and we say, well, you know, I, I chose to take this job and I chose this wife and I choose to like this music. And yet, some, in some ways, those are quite superficial things about who I am. You know, I never chose my family. I never chose my genetic makeup. Yeah. I never chose my up, upbringing. I never chose the, the century in which I lived, the culture in which I was brought up. And these things just shape us massively. And the Bible says, yeah, there's a massive century in which we're shaped by our family. Yes. And at the top of that family tree, Adam, Adam has taken us in a bad direction. Yeah. Good news, Jesus ah. invites you into his family. So if we, then is that maybe taking us towards the, the one? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I, I, I guess keeping going on the two. Yeah, let's just carry one, on two for a little bit for, longer. For one little bit is because when Jesus comes, 
Uh, again, that that mm. being problem, the being problem, is is really dealt with by Jesus. That that in his baptism, he he comes and and he is numbered among the transgressors, jumps into the Jordan River with us to be in solidarity with us, to be one with us, to um, to be our champion, if yeah. you like. And and just as Adam was our sort of champion who took us down into death and. You know, so so, so that in that story that with us the baptism and the whole way in that little bit yeah. were because of course after the baptism as well when Jesus heads off into the wilderness and the devil comes yeah. and all that it's very go on, what's going on because that does sound suspiciously like the Adam story very like the Adam story you know when is the devil ever audible in giving temptations to people and 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 you know actually well in the Garden of Eden and again uh, with with the temptations and so what we have there is 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 Jesus being the second Adam yeah. and and where where Satan tempted Adam to serve himself and to you know to, to go to the tree for himself to serve himself feed himself so Satan comes to Jesus and, yeah. and gives him the temptation you know will you feed yourself will you live for yourself will you do that and and Jesus the one man who resists Satan wow. in all those sorts of ways and undoes Adam's kind of work and as our champion. And again, I, th- I think people get champion get as well. I, I remember you, you, you gave me a great illustration of, uh, of footballs. Yeah. You know, so, so the, the, in the transfer window, you want the, the one man. Yeah. Go on, go on, give, you a, give you a one man illustration. Well, no, I can't remember, but it's just that sense in which you, you all want this one man. And then yeah. when he comes around, well, you invest all your hopes in this one guy. You say, yeah. oh, if we have him. Yeah. And then when you get him and he yeah. comes out and then, yay! Yeah, yeah. And the whole stadium erupts because he's out there doing the stuff for you. Yeah, exactly. He's your champion. He's and, our champion. And he lifts the trophy for you. You haven't expended a calorie we of effort. We haven't done anything. We just <laughs> watch. You jump up and down and you sing and you We've rejoice. Won. We've won. We've won. We've won. And then I say to the non-Christian, that's how Christians feel about Jesus. Yeah. We've won. You know, he's the one man who came into our team to turn things around. Yeah. We, were, we were headed for relegation. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus, you know, scores the winning goal against yeah. Satan and sin and death <laughs> and hell and, yeah. and rises up again. And he says, my victory is your victory. And yeah. a Christian is just someone who says, ah. You're my Yay. champion. You're my champion, and your victory is my victory. Yeah. So that's what's so good at the sense of like with Adam, everybody dies in Adam. The yeah. Bible says that. So when a person maybe go, you know, there's that sense of oh, no, no, I'm just myself. And sometimes people sort of think if I eat healthily enough and do enough yeah. exercise, I'll never die. Yeah. Like there's almost the assumption goes, no, no, literally everybody in Adam will die. Yeah. And yeah. that's happened with a hundred percent correct like that. Yeah. Nobody's ever evaded it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we're all perishing. And we need perishing. to recover all that language yes. that the Bible uses of, yes. of death and perishing. And sometimes we use language of fall, even though the Bible doesn't really use the language use of that. fall. Yeah. Far more seriously, we're dead. Yeah. Dead. Cut off. Yeah. Strange, alienated. Yeah. Uh, perishing. All, and, and I think when we start using categories of being rather than simply behavior... Yes. All that language comes yes. back into play and it's so fruitful in evangelism. Brilliant. And the cleanness, and I like the cleanness one that we mentioned earlier because yeah. I'm finding a lot of people who've never been to church know what it's like to be unclean yeah. and that sometimes have obsessions about cleansing because yeah. they've Fair done much. things or things have been done to them that make them feel unclean and they yes. cannot clean themselves yeah. because it's at that deeper level of yeah. who they are. Yeah, completely. And, and we need an answer to that, which Jesus doesn't just... Take away the misdeeds that you've done. Yeah. But he offers you new birth. Ah, you know? yes. And quite often in, in evangelism, I'll, I'll talk to people and, and they might not know anything about the Bible, but they know the phrase born again. Yeah, they do, yeah. And I'll start saying to them, have you ever heard the phrase born again? Well, this is what I'm talking about with two. You know, you're, you're born in Adam and you share in his selfishness and his stuff-ups and his shame and his self-protection and his self-justification. You share, you share in that, don't you? You know that you're estranged from God. You know yeah. that. Well, here's the new birth that's Wouldn't offered you like you in Jesus. Wouldn't you like a new life? Wouldn't you like a new life? Yeah. Free from all that <sighs> shame and... Yeah. And that's the dream every new year. When yeah. like, I want a new life and yes. I'm going to make it happen yes. by yeah. losing half a stone or something. I, I often get that in evangelism. People say no one wants to hear about repentance in evangelism. Oh, no. Yeah. Everyone wants to hear about repentance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you go to a news agent yeah. and you, you scan the magazines and it's row all saying row. repent, repent, repent. Because it's all saying be new. Yeah. A new you, you know, six steps to new abs and, you know, declutter your life. And you know, I find at service stations, uh, yeah. you go uh, on most 
motorways. You go to the service station, they, that's when you're vulnerable because yes. you've just wasted huge amounts of money on terrible food and then you stumble <laughs> to look at the butcher shop and it's like, yeah. be a better you, isn't it? Like, yeah. use your time more efficiently yeah. and do... It's yeah. all about yeah. that. It's actually preaching repentance is good all, news. Yeah, it's good news. Here's a new life a to new be. Way. You can't summon it up yourself. Yes. But it's a gift given to you. Don't you want to be new? Of course you do. Wow. We've had three. Mm. That's the living God. And we've got to start with the three who actually are God. Yeah. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yeah. any other starting point will take us to a different God. Yeah. We want to go to this God. So we start with Jesus, who is describes himself and is presented as the one sent from the Father in the power of the Spirit. We cannot talk about Jesus without talking about the three who are the one true living God. Right. Yeah. The two is Adam and Jesus, and that makes sense of myself and my helplessness and everything about me. And it's the good news because there's an alternative which kind of leads us to the one, that's the final point about this, which you said is who we are united to Adam. That's mm. whether we, we don't get a choice. No. Who are you going to be united no. to? You no. already are united to Adam. Yeah. We're, that's how we're born. We're all biologically descended from Adam. Mm. Oh, what, before yeah, we do that, yeah, let yeah. me just deal with that. Yeah. The biologically descended from Adam. Yeah. What if someone goes, yeah. that isn't true. Yeah. What do you say? I think at that point I'd go to 1 Corinthians 15 and just sort of say, well, okay, step into this world for a minute. I'm not, I'm not trying to build stepping stones no, no. towards a, a Christian understanding and say, this is reasonable, therefore that's reasonable, yeah. therefore that's reasonable. But I am saying, come on in and hear this story. And within this story, according to 1 Corinthians 15, according to the Apostle Paul, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse uh, 21, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And I just say, do you see that within this story, you might not agree yeah, yeah. with this story, but within this story... Um, if Christ rose, Adam fell. That's, that's kind of what Paul's doing. He yeah. said, Adam fell, Christ rose. So what I'm saying to you, if Christ rose, Adam fell. Yeah. That's what I, and so let, let's talk about, you know, do we, do we think Christ rose from the dead? And I, and I, I you know, present things from 1 Corinthians about yeah. whether Christ rose from the dead. Yeah. I think that's the way. Yeah. The way to do it. Your Romans 5 would be a 5. similar way of just saying Same the Bible's thing. saying this is how things work. And, there's, yeah. and that the story about Jesus versus Adam, it comes up in Hosea. Yeah. All the way through the Bible is that yeah. sense in which this is what happened with Adam. Mm. This is what happens with Jesus. And the Bible invites you to see things this way. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So step inside that story and see if it makes sense rather than Man, stay know, outside go to the human and, genome yes. project and figure out okay. whether there's a, an ancestor yeah. like that. That's not what I'm interested That's in. That's not going to tell you anything important about no. what's wrong with us. Yeah. yeah. But if you meet the risen Jesus, then, then you know that the story is true that Adam fell. Yeah. I know. And the reason I know about Adam is because I know about Jesus. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. He's the yeah. starting point yeah. again. Yeah. Exactly. Beautiful. So number one then. I am united to Adam. Mm. That's my who I am, yeah. and all about me, and where I my destiny. I'm going to die. Yeah. Uh, all that, all that comes out of that. But yeah. will I be yeah. united to Jesus? Yeah. Let yeah. me ask right away. What does that mean? United yeah. to Jesus. I mean, yeah. Jesus isn't around. Where is he? I can't see him. What does it mean to be united to anybody? Yeah. Like, what does that mean? Well, I, I might use the champion illustration yes. of, the, of the footballer. Right. You, are, you are one with, with your that, champion. Yeah. His victory is your victory, yeah. though you have not expended a calorie yeah. of effort in the, in yeah. the victory. Um, or, you know, we, we kind of understand when we go to the airport, you know, if, if, I, if I want to fly back home, if I want to fly back to Australia, you know, yeah. and I see the, the airplane at, at Heathrow, what relationship do I need to have in order to get back to Australia? You know, would it help if I followed the plane? Would it help if I put myself under the supreme authority of the plane? Would it help if I was inspired by the example of the plane? Just it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. You could. Um, no, I, what I need to do is I need to be in the plane. And yeah, then I'm whatever okay. happens to the plane happens to me. Right. Now, that doesn't exactly explain what, how you get to be in, in Christ, but it, it does give us the, the idea of what being in Christ is. And, yeah. I, and I think one of the analogies I... I bring out very, very quickly in evangelism is marriage. Yes, right. Um, right from almost the first page of the Bible, we, talk, we hear about Adam and Eve were united and they became one yeah. flesh. And uh, of course, uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 says, yeah, I'm saying that's Christ and the church. Yeah. So we are one with Jesus the way that a bride is one with her husband. 
And at that stage, I think marriage is such a fruitful il illustration. It's, yeah. You've got endless applications. Uh, but I, I often say, you know, when, when my wife and I got married, you know, and, and in fact, you preached at our wedding. Didn't yeah. you? <laughs> you, were, you were there. And um, there, there was a point where the, uh, the celebrant um, was Rico Tice, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and he said, um, uh, will you say these vows? And we said, you know, all that I am I give to you and all that I have I share with you. And at that point, there were literally sniggers in the congregation because uh, people realized well, we'd just come out of university and yeah. had absolutely nothing to share with one another whatsoever. But I think in this marriage, the marriage between Christ and us, we are full of debts yeah. and he is full of riches. Yeah. But what is, it, what is the offer of Christ? The offer is Christ is he says, all that I am, I give to you. And all that I have, I share with you. All my righteousness, all my peace, all my blessing, all my place in the family, yeah. my inheritance, the whole creation, it's all yours. All yours. And we, if we are one and wooed by the love of Jesus, then of course we say, Phew, all I am, I, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. And, and what's that? All our yeah. sin, all our shame. You know, and that shame thing again, yeah. you know, in, in marriage, it's so precious, isn't it? Yeah. When the bride takes the groom's name. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the, the name of the groom covers over the bride's old name. Yeah. It used to be known as so-and-so. Yeah. And yet now in the Lord Jesus, we have a new name, we have yeah. a new identity, a new status, and we are one with Christ forever. I think that's so powerful because when you mentioned about the footballer illustration mm -hmm. or sometimes like that, mm -hmm. where you'll have, uh, I don't know, the, the sometimes um, I was hearing recently and someone was saying that the child was, I don't know which footballer it was, so I mean... You know, maybe it was Wayne Rooney or something, and they were like, "They're absolutely full of yeah. Wayne Rooney." Right. And it was like they're yeah. full of him. What did they mean? Yeah. That he had they had posters up. They studied oh him. They oh listened dear. to everything oh he said. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. there was a way in which they said they were sort of modelling themselves on him. They had like a kit with his name on or something. <laughs> and I thought that was quite insightful because yeah. it's like saying yeah. that's what it is. That a person would say, "Here's Jesus, yeah. and here I am." Yeah. And I've understood that, you know, I'm helpless and I, I'm go I'm, I've only got death. I've only got shame. I've only got sin. I keep messing up. And I, even when I think I won't do that again, I just do it again. And yeah. I know it's because of what I am deep yeah. down. But look at him. Yeah. And I don't know how to live. And then he says, yeah. look at my way. And yeah. then he tells us his way and yeah. shows us it. And then he says, now let's put that old way to death. Yes. And here's a new one. Yeah. And I go... I love that. And yeah. then we sort of are so caught up with him. We want people to go, he's just full of Jesus. He's full of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. In and that same sort of way where you've exactly. abandoned your own identity yeah. and sort of trying to take on an, yeah. his identity. Yeah. And, and there's, a, there's an order to it as well. Yes. In that, you know, Martin Luther sort of got the Reformation going in 1520, you know, wrote on, on the freedom of a Christian. And, and really his key kind of illustration of it was the marriage one. And he, said, and he said, you know, imagine that a prince marries a prostitute, okay? Now, the, the, the day that they get married, it, again, the minute they exchange vows, that prostitute is a princess. Instantly. Oh, yeah. Instantly. Even though in her heart, she's quite, you know... She may not have really quite, changed very much. She might not have yeah. changed very much, but of the course of the marriage, she yeah. is a princess. Instantly, instantly, she is in her groom and united Brilliant. to him. Right. But then over time, absolutely, she becomes to learn the ways of the court Wonderful. and she learns and she becomes, you know, more and more like her bridegroom. And I think that's that's the, the order of things, isn't it? First, we're in Christ. Yes. Straight away. Straight away in Christ. And then the more we understand his love, receive his love, then we become more and more. He is in us and fills yeah. us and we become like him. I found that so powerful as I've increasingly spent more and more time with people who've never been to church at all mm. and come with huge issues of shame and guilt and mess ups and things like that. And it's just so wonderful. That it's like, well, I, sometimes I was speaking to someone just this, just like yesterday, no, day before at church. And they said, oh, I couldn't come to church for the past few weeks because I was in such a mess. Oh, no. And it was great yeah. to be able to say, Hang on, <laughs> like you, you, if you know, that's when you do come yeah. Yeah. because literally Jesus' yeah. whole thing is come to me if you're weary and you're yeah. worn out and yeah. you're a sinner and yeah. your life's the biggest mess up ever. Yeah. And that's why the very last thing he does on the cross, there's a guy who's a total mess up yeah. and he's being executed for it as a criminal. Yeah. And the guy cannot do anything to sort his life out. He can't do it. And he, all he just says is, Jesus, will you remember me? Yeah. And that's yeah. it. He's yeah. like, all he's really saying is, my humanity is this. Yeah. It's cursed yeah. and finished and I've got no hope in it. Yeah. 
when I look over at that guy, that's a different sort of humanity. Yeah, as he looks yeah. across to Jesus, yeah. will you take me? Yeah. And Jesus said, I will, t- I yeah. will, I do. Yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. And therefore the churches that we have are ones that are full of broken people broken who understand people. shame. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's another thing that I've enjoyed about doing 3, 2, 1 is yes. that one is a truth that leads very naturally to church. Church. So of course, because, you know, it's the, cr- it's the church that is one. Yes. With, her, with her bridegroom. Because of the marriage Christ. illustration. Because of the marriage illustration. All of a sudden, it's very a very organic way of saying, hey, if you want in on Jesus, and I hope you do, then you are in with me yes. and you and, and all these other sinners. Yeah. We're all broken people. But in, in that way, it's a very organic invite to church. It's yes. a very organic thing that, that, of course, you can't have. Christ without having all the other people who are in him. Yeah, because he's the head, the body is the church. So if a person says, well, I'm united to Christ over, I'm united to Christ individually. I don't really go to church. No, dude, no, no, this is his body over here. If you want to be united to the head, (laughs) get, Here's yeah. his body coming to or, his body. Or, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and yeah. I'm, I'm just this little thing. I'm a sitting over here in my own private plant pot. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 you can't be. How could that be? Yeah. And therefore, I, I've enjoyed that because sometimes in evangelism, it can be almost like the fine print. Yes. Someone becomes right. a Christian by themselves. They kneel beside their bed and, or they individually read a tract and something. Oh, now I'm a Christian. Well, what's the connection with church there? Yeah, there isn't one. There isn't one. Here. And then all of a sudden you have to say, oh, by the way. I've got to introduce you to this thing called church. Yes. Oh, what you never told me anything about. What's, what's the organic connection of you must go to church yes. with so many gospel presentations? Nothing. Yeah. Well, in so many cases, yeah. there's, there's not that much. So I've enjoyed the organic unity of saying being invited to Christ is being invited to church. Yes. Really is. I love that, that you want to mm. just say, how can I be united to Christ? He's the head of the church. Come to church. Yeah. Head yeah. and body, beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Even it's, it's so much more a theme all the yeah. way through the scriptures. Yeah. If you were, I don't know, if you lived in a thousand BC and you were like, yeah. "How can I be saved?" Well, let's come and join Go the church. Come and yeah. join yeah. Jerusalem. There's, yeah. there's rules for how you could join and become a member yeah. of the church. Yeah. Then, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so helpful. Yeah. So it's been great talking about three to one. We've taught so much theology, so many big truths from the Bible. But if we were to go out now, could we really just start talking about Adam, Jesus, church, mm. shame, mm. all these mm. sorts of oh, Christ, mm. the cross, resurrection? I've been told, I hear it all the time. No, what we need to do is start with like um, common sense, reasonable things that any reasonable person would believe in. Start with those and then let's try and build up towards these kind of things. What's all that about, Glenn? <sighs> what is all that about? I mean, that can't be the way of doing evangelism, especially because, you know, in the Bible, um, knowing God is very much twinned with the way that we're saved by God. So throughout the Bible, it's always saying that the only people who know God are those who are saved by God. And to not be saved by God is not to know God. And it's almost like the same thing. In fact, John 17, 3, Jesus says, salvation is knowing God through him. So if salvation and and knowing God are kind of the same things, then surely since we are saved entirely by grace, it's all God descending to us to offer us salvation. Are we really going to say that knowing God goes the other way? What are we saying? Ah, you, yes. You know, if we don't earn our salvation, if, it, if it's not me sort of, I, you know, I'm, you know I, I give blood and I'm nice to my sister and I help old grannies across my road and I just need a little top up by Jesus yeah. and then I'll be saved. Well, that, that's kind of what people are saying when they're saying, well, we know this to be true and therefore there's that and therefore from this to that and there's a hop, skip and a jump to that yeah. and then I just need a little top up and yeah. then I'll know God. And it's, it's exactly the same kind of works righteousness that's applied in the area of knowing God. Right. It can't be that. So that's, that's kind of my... So is that with the Adam idea that when we were thinking about the problem that we're in, Adam, that mm. is in our minds, yes. that there's a fundamental problem yeah. where people go, no, look, I'm a reasonable person. And the Bible, if the Bible is really going to say, whoa, 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 yeah. you're in Adam. Yeah. There's something that's yeah. fundamentally wrong with the yeah. way you know and think. Yeah. Is that so right? yeah, two Corinthians four four. You know, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Yeah. 
or you know, one Corinthians. Oh, sorry, um, uh, Colossians one twenty one, isn't it? Colossians one twenty one. That enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior. Yeah. You know, Ephesians we, four, the futility of the thinking of unbelievers. Yeah. Thinking. So some, yeah. we can sometimes think that our minds are our least fallen faculty. According to Paul, it's probably the most fallen. The most faculty. fallen. So, uh, so the Bible doesn't really go. Look, you're a reasonable minded person. <laughs> this is how it is. Yeah. The Bible is really saying you probably are going to deny everything that we're going to tell you, but we're going to tell you anyway because yeah. it's true. Yeah. And we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will yeah. open your eyes, open your ears. Yeah. I suppose Jesus does say that, doesn't he? Quite often when he starts preaching, he'll say, those who have ears to... What's that about? Why did, what does he say? He says, those... hear, let him hear. And, and fulfillment of Isaiah 6, which is like, you know, to those on the outside, it's all a mystery. To those on the inside, the meaning is, is given, and, 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 and he even says you've got, got to become like a little child to be one of these insiders who receives that personal knowledge from him. If you try to remain outside of Christ and piece it together yourself, you'll never get it. Would it be fair to say that the, perhaps one of the reasons that in, perhaps in modern age there's so much reliance then on evidence and human reason, these things, is this too much to say it's a lack of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? Oh, interesting. In in that, go on. Well, in that, because I, like when I think about, I always think about some of the, I read the early church guys a lot, and they went into in, incredible situations. Mm. Irenaeus or people would mm. say, okay, here's a whole country full of complete pagans right. who've yeah, never read yeah. the Bible at yeah. all. And you're like, yeah. dude, you can't do that. You need massive yeah. training, and I'm going to yeah. teach you how to present evidence. I'm going to give you a, a massive yeah. training in the culture of the of the the Gauls or the Celts or yes. something. And he's like, no, no, don't worry about that. I know about Jesus. I'm just going to go and tell them about Jesus. Yeah. And he does. Yeah. And there are churches everywhere. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's How is he sp- able to do that? Well, it's that whole Spurgeon thing, isn't it? You know, you know, defend a lion, says Spurgeon. I, you know, I, no, defend the gospel, he says. I would rather defend a lion. lion. Let the lion out of its cage. The lion will defend itself. Yes. And really... What I'm trying to do is kind of let the lion out of its cage, yeah. out of his cage, yes. and let him do his work by the Spirit, because the, we, we believe that the Spirit works through his Word. Yeah. As the gospel word is proclaimed, that is God's power for salvation. Mm. So, uh, I mean, the, the, other, the other reason where I, why I'm not so good at uh, or not so interested in the whole stepping stone approach yes. and building it up is because I'm not good at it and I'm, yeah. I, I don't think I'm that clever I can't no, I'm not clever I, enough. I, yeah. I, I can't bridge from from you know they're talking about the European Union I, I need to be able to bridge from that to a discussion of the atonement or yeah. you know we're, we're discussing the offside rule in the pub and I can turn that into a proclamation oh, of Jesus yeah. your last defender you know and <laughs> I think you've, you've got to be Really cheesy yeah. to be like that, and you've got to be a lot cleverer than I am to be to be able to bridge in in that sort of way. So evangelism for me is it's not so much build stepping stones from the Christian you know from the non Christian world over to the Christian house, and it's not so much throwing stones yeah. at the non Christian house. I'm not really interested in that. Really, it's hospitality. It's come yeah. on over to the Christian house. Come and see. Do you have five minutes? Yeah. Can I give you the grand tour of the house? Yeah. You might think this is nuts. From the outside, this looks like complete nuts. I understand yeah. that. I understand that. I used to think it was nuts too. But let me give you the grand tour. Yeah. And then afterwards, if you've still got some questions, we'll talk through those questions according to the grand tour, according to 321. But have you got five minutes? Yeah. Can, can so, I indulge you? Yeah. Like the woman of Samaria. She's just like, hey, I just met this guy, Jesus. He told me everything I, ever, I have ever done. Yeah. Can I just tell you about it? And then everyone's like, yeah. really? Yeah. And she doesn't, I don't know what her theology is like, but she's just really excited about Jesus and talks about him. Yeah, exactly. Or the guy in John 9. Yeah. I don't know. They don't ask know. him really complicated questions. He hasn't know. got a clue. He goes, I don't know. I this don't is what know. I can tell you. I don't know. It's just about Jesus. Isn't that great, isn't it? And that way in which, as you say, let me just tell you what I do know. Yeah. And I'm not that clever and I haven't got all yeah. the answers, but I do know this. Yeah. yeah. And it's incredible what an impact it has if we just do that. And do it in the context of the local church. Because yes. that's, that's really what it is to say, come on over come to on our in. house. Come on over to our house. Let me give you the grand tour. I know you think it's nuts right now. Of course you yeah. think it's nuts. You know, any, any, anyone out there would think it's nuts. Of course yeah. they would. But let me give you the grand tour. And then maybe you'll start to see things yeah. differently. Maybe the questions that you ask will start changing. Maybe you'll start changing. Yeah. And I like that, that because church is the place where people aren't judged. Mm. So, and it's a, the one place, really, where people won't be judged. And so uh, we always say to people, oh, no, they'll say, I can't come to church because I'm an atheist or there's this thing I've done or, I, or I'm in this sort of relationship. Or the, I'm like, don't worry 
about that. Yeah. This is a place we literally, yeah. the, Jesus yeah. commanded us not to yeah. judge. Come along, yeah. you will be, obviously no one has to. And people come along and they might be initially, yeah, really strongly atheist. And usually they can be a bit defensive. They're like, well, you know, I, I don't believe in any of this. That's all right. Don't worry. Have a cup of tea, sit down, <laughs> see what it's like. Everyone yeah. loves you. Yeah. And then over the weeks, they do start to change yeah. without having a big, and without someone going, here, let me sort you out on that issue or this issue or yep. this issue. Yep. In a way, they're in, they come in and they're welcome. Yep. And then they yep. hear about Jesus yep. and things change. They ask different sorts of questions. And isn't that exactly what 1 Peter means when he talks no, about to ask you apologetics because the word apologetics that's what loads of people say oh you can't go out on the streets talking to people until you've had loads of training in cross-cultural yeah. this and yeah. bridge building that yeah. and i sort of think i don't know whether any apostles had any of that but peter wrote about it what's yeah. it what's a biblical understanding of apologetics apologetics well the whole thing hangs on one word apologia which means giving an answer and in 1 peter 3 verse 15 it says uh uh, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Wow. That verse, I mean, it comes in a context. You know, the, the whole paragraph begins in verse 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. And do you see the, yeah. the, that church context? Church. And then, you know, the reason for the hope that you have. What hope's he talking about? Well, he begins the letter yep. by saying, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Yeah. So the hope that he's given is Jesus is alive and I've met him. And as people see how I'm bearing up under suffering, they see the quality of church relationships. They ask, what's it all about? Brilliant. You say, well, Jesus is alive. He Jesus is alive. alive. Let, me, let me proclaim that to you. Um, so I, I think that's kind of biblical apologetics, if yeah. you like. To literally be able to say, ah, you see, you know, I see what church, person comes to church. I see what it's about. Can you explain how it is that you live like this and think like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah. And then you don't have to go, let me come up with some philosophy or archaeology or this. Other. No, Just say, no. To be honest. This is what we believe about Jesus yeah. and lay it all out. Three, two, one. Three, yeah. two, one. <laughs> well, you yeah. could do three. I mean, and, and three, two, one is just designed to be that yes. kind of tool that at that point you can say that. And, and I think what, what I like about it is it's, it's not really about trying to crowbar a spiritual connection into a conversation. Yeah. But are you able with a, a non-Christian work colleague or, or family member to say, hey, you know I'm a Christian. Can I take five minutes at some point? It doesn't have to be now, but can we get a coffee at some point? Can I take five minutes and explain that to you? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a cringy kind of a thing. Yeah. But it's, it's not really trying to crowbar Jesus in or build a, a, a stepping stones to it, but it's, it's just to say, will you take five minutes and yeah. can I just give you the story yeah. and see how you react to it? I think that's what evangelism is, telling the story. And so as we come to the end of this, I know quite a few of the people who will be watching this are people who are trying to learn a lot more theology and they may be yeah. just starting out and they're like, I want to learn a lot of theology. Is this, is, three, two, one really is, a, is helpful because instead of it being something over here, yeah. it's right at the center, isn't it, of learning theology and studying the Bible. So that in a way, the more theology you study, the more Bible you learn, yeah. you fill out your ability to, ex go on, I'm saying what you should yeah, say. Yeah, no, I, I, I hope it is that. And, and, you know, I think my evangelism was transformed about sort of 12 years ago when I met you, actually. <laughs> I, was, I was doing um, open air evangelism. On a Thursday night. Yeah, I remember those times. And, uh, and looking back on it, I was very keen. I was full of beans. But what I was offering to people wasn't always the bread of life. I think it was quite often it was kind of uh, sawdust seasoned with chili sauce. <laughs> you know, not really, not really life giving, but given a bit of pep, you know, sort of thing. And, and you got wind of this and, and you, you suggested that there's this other thing on a Thursday night. You said that you were doing and you were doing a theology course that talks about Trinity and it talks about Adam and Christ. It talks about union with Christ. It talks about all these things. Will you, for a season, and yeah. lay off the evangelism and come, <laughs> and come and actually learn what the gospel is. <laughs> because we, uh, we always multiply the faith that we have. Yeah. And if we don't have, you know, if we've got dodgy understanding of the gospel, we're only going to create dodgy Christians if they yeah. come to Christ. And so that was so helpful to me to see that actually going deep with Trinity, going deep with all these issues, um, was not escaping from evangelism. 
but it was aiding the evangelism that I had. Um, that, that's really been transforming the way I think, not only about the gospel and evangelism, but also about theology and growing yeah. in the Christian life. If you can't think about these things simply, then perhaps you don't really understand them. So that, yeah. the, the attempt of three, two, one is not really an attempt to have this gospel presentation over here and theologies over here, but it's just, it's just this Same attempt thing. to be as simple as I can about the, the theology that we ought to believe. And what I found so helpful with you, Glenn, is as well uh, on your blog and all the things and with the books, the King's English and things, it's where you can say the whole Bible, really, anything mm. you get in the Bible, you can sit down with your work colleague or family memory, really, and be able to go, can I, have we just got a minute? Because yeah. let me just show you this. Yeah. Yeah. And any part of the Bible, it's not as if, oh, the only bits you can show to the non-Christian are these four bits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, no, anything yeah. is full of Christ and yes. full of hope and yeah. Yeah. insight yeah. and truth. Yeah. And if we understand it, we can share any of it with yeah. anybody and, yeah. they, and they will enjoy that. Yeah, completely. Because we're not sharing a system, is it? We're sharing Christ himself. Christ. And th I, I perish the thought that 3 to 1 becomes a system that we yeah. share in, instead of Christ. Yeah. It's just an attempt to say, actually, Jesus shapes what we think about God. He's three. Yeah. Jesus shapes how the world goes. Yeah. It's two. Jesus shaped how I think about myself, union with him. It's just an attempt really to clear away systems and just focus us on Jesus. Do you know, Glenn, that's so helpful. Thanks so much for your mm. time. And I hope if you're watching, you'll be inspired to share that. Even right now, can I challenge you, if you're watching this and you're a Christian, you love Jesus, why not, before the day is finished, see if you can actually take five minutes with someone to explain three, two, one. Thank you.